Hello once again. I am so excited today because I got to bring my wife, Christina, out here in the woods and she has a very special message to share with us from God's Word. So before we get started, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this opportunity once again to come out here and enjoy the beauties of your creation and the beautiful messages of your Word. I pray that you will be with Christina as she shares today. I pray that you will guide the hearts and minds of each one who is listening today, that we may have a deeper experience with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Christina, I'm not sure all of what you've got to talk about, but I can't wait to hear it. Well, let's go for a walk in the woods. All right, let's go. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience where you were just just high up there with the Lord and just so excited about being spiritual and spending time with Him and then all of a sudden the bottom was pulled out from you and you had the most discouraging experience of your entire life? Or maybe you haven't had that high mountaintop experience, but have you ever dealt with discouragement or maybe depression? Have you ever felt like what is the value of my life? What am I doing? Why am I here? I'm just not good enough. Or why am I even alive? If you've dealt with this, I just want you to know you're not alone. And as we go for this walk in the woods and dig into the Bible, we're going to explore a Bible story that you may not have thought about. And I hope it's an encouragement to you. They smell so good. River coming down. See the rocks. The beautiful ridges. You feel like you're on top of the world here, on top of the mountain. When I think of a mountaintop experience, like the mountain we're on right now, here on top of the world, of course this isn't really a mountain, this is the top of a ridge, but it feels like you're up on top of a mountain. When I open the Bible and think of someone who had a mountaintop experience, the first one that comes to my mind is Elijah. Just think, Elijah had just spent three years uh, going to King Ahab, telling him there'd be no dew and rain, uh, he has been miraculously preserved through the famine, through the king searching for his life, and now uh, he brings everybody, all of Israel, to Mount Carmel, shows himself to the king, is not killed, is mercifully spared, has an amazing experience with all of the prophets of Baal, 
calling for fire to come down from heaven and consume their sacrifice. And of course, nothing happened. And then in the evening sacrifice, after all day on top of this mountain, on Mount Carmel, he builds an altar, covers it in water, submerges it, like fills up trenches of water around it, submerges the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and everything so wet, and then simply kneels down and says one prayer. And that one prayer brought fire down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, licked up all the water. All of Israel says, the Lord, he is God. And they enthusiastically join him in destroying all the idols and all the prophets of Baal and everything. And then as they all leave to go home, there's not a cloud in the sky anywhere. It was a beautiful, bright, sunny day. And Elijah just walks up to King Ahab and says, King Ahab, you better go eat dinner because the rain's going to be coming soon. And then he climbed even higher, clear up to the very peak of Mount Carmel and began to pray. He prayed earnestly for rain. And six times he sent his servant out to look and saw nothing. And finally, the seventh time, after another earnest prayer, the servant says, I see a little cloud, size of a man's hand coming out of the sea. You may remember Pastor Daniel talking about that last week uh, in the sermon on the second coming. But as he saw that little cloud, his faith grasped, there's rain coming. And so he sends another message to King Ahab, quit eating, get in your chariot right now and head home because there's a storm coming. And sure enough, by the time King Ahab got in his chariot and began headed out, the storm rolled in. Thick black clouds, thunder, lightning, torrents of rain. The king couldn't even see in front of his chariot. And Elijah, with the faith and power of God, becomes the servant to run in front of his chariot after this whole long arduous day and runs in front of the king's chariot to show him the way all the way back from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, where the king lived, which is quite a distance to run through driving rain. But you know what? He was still on that mountaintop experience high. He was so excited. He was thrilled because all of Israel had acknowledged that God was the true God and there would be no more Baal worship. His life as a prophet would be so much easier. And he was so excited. He finally gets to the city of Jezreel and the king goes off to his palace, but Elijah didn't go home. He just simply, in the pouring rain, wraps himself in his mantle and lays down on the mud and goes to sleep. But he didn't care. His faith was so strong. He was so excited. It didn't matter that it was raining. I mean, he'd been praying for rain. That was the answer to his prayers. And to know that he was going to wake up in the morning to see the biggest reformation that Israel had ever had, he was so excited and he fell into an exhausted sleep. Elijah was a man of so much faith. But he wasn't the only one in the Bible who had faith. If we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verses 33 and 34, we're told that many of our Bible heroes subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight the armies of aliens. Can we have that faith today? Absolutely. What did Jesus say? Uh, Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, he says, 
if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. All things to anyone who believes. We can have that same mountaintop experience, that same faith that Elijah had today. But how can we? Who else had so much faith in the Bible? You think of Jacob as he persevered that night as he was praying and wrestling with the angel. God says, that's the type of faith I want you to have. But Jesus said, even if it starts as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, remove hence to yonder place. Now, maybe you may not ask an actual mountain to move, but maybe your problems seem like a mountain looming up ahead. Jesus says that little faith can move mountains, just like Elijah's faith. So we left Elijah sound asleep in the pouring rain, laying in the mud wrapped in his mantle. He's sleeping so soundly because he's so exhausted when suddenly there's a tap on his shoulder. He doesn't really notice it. And then he suddenly jolts to consciousness with someone rudely shaking him awake. He opens his eyes and there's a messenger standing there in the blackness and the pouring rain. And the messenger says, I have a message for you from Queen Jezebel. His heart stops as he listens to the words. And we find it in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 2. As Jezebel says, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I may not make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. His life as the life of one of those prophets that of Baal that he had just killed the day before. He didn't even like even stop to think. He just simply got up and ran for his life. Now, did Elijah have to run? No. He had just experienced this huge mountaintop experience with God. He had just spent three years where God hid him from King Ahab, who was seeking his life every day for three years. And suddenly he forgets. You know, I often think about what might have happened if he hadn't gone up and run. What kind of miracles could God have worked for him again? Maybe God could have sent judgments on Queen Jezebel for all Israel to see. And it would have been a second uh, major event in this giant reformation in Israel. And Elijah would have come out as a conqueror with God and huge, a huge reform could have been wrought. But he didn't even think about that. He was exhausted. He was tired. The only thing he wanted to do was sleep and wake up in the morning and help Israel with this reformation and to have this suddenly pulled out from under him, all he could think about was everything I just did yesterday was for nothing. Israel has not chosen God. They're still in rebellion and they're gonna kill me next and it's all over. And so he ran. And you know, when we read in the Bible, it says that he ran uh, to from Jezreel where he was leaving to Beersheba, and there he left his servant. You know, when you think of it, we don't often t stop and look at a map to see how far that is, but uh, Jezreel to Beersheba, that was a hundred miles. And then he left his servant there and continued running another day's journey into the middle of nowhere. He didn't even know where he was at. He was just simply running. And here he is, he hasn't eaten. He never ate all day on top of Mount Carmel. He never ate that hundred miles that he fled to Beersheba. And he still hasn't eaten for another day's journey into the wilderness. And he finally just is so exhausted, he can't take another step. He doesn't know why he's here, what he's doing. He's just simply running for his life. And he feels like all his work has been for nothing he is so discouraged, so depressed. He sits down under what the King James Version says is a juniper tree. 
uh, other translations say a broom bush. It was just a little straggly bush in the middle of nowhere, probably not near as pretty as this bush is here. But he sat down under a tree and he says to God in verse 4, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. What? Take away my life? What happened to that mountaintop experience yesterday? What is Elijah going through right now? He is going through the deepest valley of depression he has ever experienced in his entire life. And he falls asleep. So miserable. So exhausted. So depressed. His life work has ended in a pile of nothing. And all he can think about is, there's nobody in Israel except me. I'm the only one out there. I'm the only prophet of God. And now they're going to kill me and that'll be the end. And what happens to God? He was so discouraged. And as he slept, he was jolted awake by a touch in the middle of the wilderness. And he sprung up ready to flee for his life again when he looked into the kindest, most gentle face that he'd ever seen in his life. And it was an angel. And the angel says to him, arise and eat. And he looks and right next to his head is a little bottle of water. And there's a little fire with coals and a cake, probably bread of some sort, baked on it, ready to eat, homemade bread in the wilderness. He was so exhausted and so disoriented, he got up, ate it, drank, and fell right back to sleep, exhausted. And then a tap on his shoulder again, as he woke up again and saw that same kind, pitying, loving, tender expression on that angel's face. As he says, Elijah, you need to eat and drink one more time because you've got a long journey ahead of you and you've got to get some nourishment. And so Elijah gets up and he eats and drinks again and then he goes off into the wilderness. Elijah had been fleeing for his life, running, running, running. He'd spent time sleeping in the wilderness. He was discouraged, but yet he had a glimmer of hope because God had taken care of him, even at his most deepest, despondent, depressing time. When he was there under that tree wanting to die, God had brought him food and water to sustain him on his journey. And so he continued on through the wilderness. For 40 days he traveled. And finally, he reached Mount Horeb, which is often another name for Mount Sinai, the same mountain where God had made himself known to the children of Israel, where he had written the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone. 
And here he was at the mountain. He found a cave and he was so exhausted once again, he spent the night there. We don't think about how long or how far he would have traveled when we think about while well, traveling 40 days. And we don't know exactly for sure which mountain it was that he traveled to, but we have approximate ideas that uh, from uh, Beersheba to where he possibly would have been in Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai area, could have been up to 200 miles that he traveled during those 40 days. And he gets there and God comes to him in that cave. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> I sent you to the king. I sent you to the brook Cherith. I sent you to the widow of Zarephath. I sent you back to the king. I sent you to Mount Carmel. I sent you to destroy the prophets of Baal. I sent you to lead Ahab's chariot through the rain. But who sent you here? Why are you here? What are you doing here? And Elijah was ready with his answer. And you know, I imagine that these words had been playing in his mind over and over like a tape recorder for the last 40 days as he traveled fleeing for his life. And he says in 1 Kings 19 verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. God listened, but he called the prophet out of the cave. And he says, I want to show you something. Just come out of the cave for just a minute. So Elijah stood out of the cave. He stepped out of the mouth of the cave and looked over the mountain. And as he looked out there and waited, the Bible says, starting in verse 11, Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face with his mantle and went out and stood in the very, very farthest entrance out of the cave in the presence of God himself. Wow, I can only imagine what was going through Elijah's mind. Here he was, awestruck by the mighty power of God, and the pride in his heart was subdued. And he realized that God was all-powerful. He could do anything. And then he hears that still small voice that says, Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah has his answer ready again. You would think that it changed after seeing this whole great big display of God's power. But no, he says the same thing again. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts. And I'm the only one left. I'm the only prophet left. There's nobody else and they're trying to kill me. What do I do? And God is so kind. 
He's just, he's so patient with us. And he just says, Elijah, you're not the only one. And I still have a work for you to do. Your life is not over. It isn't done. And here is your plan of attack. I want you to leave and go from here. And he says in verse 15, he says, I want you to go across the wilderness of Damascus and anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Then I want you to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. And then I want you to go find Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and I want you to anoint him to be the next prophet after you. You know, when I read this story, it gives me so much hope. So much hope. Because Elijah was such an amazing prophet. He went through so much. And God used him in so many ways, despite his discouragements, despite his depression, despite his mistakes, despite the fact that he ran away from an infuriated woman, of all things, for him to run from, after all that he had been through. And yet God still loved him. God was still patient with him. And he says, Elijah, I still have a work for you to do. And you know, God says the same thing to you and me. He's calling to you right now. He says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Are you doing what I have asked you to do? Are you fulfilling the mission that I have given you? What are you doing here? Are you discouraged? Does it feel like everything has fallen apart? Like everything is closing in on you? Elijah's story gives us so much hope, so much assurance that God has not forsaken us. He says, just have faith in me. Know that I am bigger and stronger than all of your discouraging circumstances. He says, I will pick you up. I love his promise in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And this was his promise to the Apostle Paul, and it's his promise to you. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. God loves you. He loved Elijah so much that when he was there in the wilderness, discouraged, and just wanting to die, he went and cooked a meal for him, gave him water, fed him, gave him strength to continue on his journey. He loves you just the same. And you know what? It was very interesting when I was reading this story. God gave Elijah a purpose. He gave him a plan of action. He gave him a work to do. And sometimes when we are the most discouraged, when we feel like we're a failure, when we feel like we can't do anything, sometimes we just have to step forward in faith and say, God, what is my purpose? What do you want me to do next? And the combination of faith and effort will bring about God's power. God will give us the power to work, to rise above our circumstances, to rise above the discouragement and the gloom and to continue on in his strength. And that's what Elijah did in our story. That's what God wants to do for you. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. And he has promised in Psalm 37 that even if you fall, you're not utterly cast down for God will pick you up and hold you in his hand. And Isaiah, he says, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. He also says in Isaiah that I am the Lord your God. I will hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. I love to picture God holding my hand 
when I'm the most discouraged, to know that he is there to pick me up and say, hey, let's do this together. I'll walk with you. I'll show you the way to go. And you don't have to cry. I'm here for you. I love to picture Jesus uh, as he says he will fleet, feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom. Have you ever thought about Jesus just coming and giving you a hug? That's what he wants to do today. Right now we have so much social distancing. It's hard to get enough hugs, especially for me. I'm a very physical touch person. I love to give hugs and it's just killing me. I can't give hugs. But Jesus says, I'm there to give you a hug. I will take care of you. I will love you. I will listen to you. And I made you. I've given you a purpose. In Jeremiah 29, he says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. Is that what you want today? Friend, I invite you to ask Jesus into your heart today. Even if you asked him and you've given up, maybe you've kicked him out the door. Open the door, let Jesus in and say, Jesus, hold my hand today. Pick me up and help me to walk with you each step of the way. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Elijah. We thank you for your promises and your word, how you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that even when Elijah messed up, when he got discouraged, you picked him up and gave him a work to do and told him his work was not finished. And Father, we claim your promises today. Even though we are discouraged, we're sinful, human, we fail so many times, we mess up your plans, but we just ask that you will take us right now and that you will use us. And we thank you so much for hearing and answering prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen.